So uh, I, I was thinking about how to ask this question. I think you're going to be cool with it, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's something that really came to mind reading your work, and in particular, um, Cataclysm Baby. Um, and I want to ask you. I want to ask you about the X Files. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the reason I want to ask you about the X Files is I remember when that show came out, and the way they were talking about it. Well, it's like sci-fi and, and horror, but but it but it's good. Right. And it got me thinking about genres mm -hmm. and genre crossing and stuff like that. And it, it, it's something that I always wonder about. And um, and, and kind of talk about in class to students, wherein I'm talking about genres like they're kind of like a pejorative. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's hard not to surprise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, um, the first thing I want to ask is, do you have a favorite X Files episode? Oh man, um, I don't know anymore. It's been so long since I've watched yeah. it. I've re I was really into it, mm -hmm. you know, when it was first on, and my. Um, uh, and my wife and I have been meaning to rewatch them, but haven't. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I really loved all the, the big conspiracy ones, like the Smoking Man and like the, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, those but are my, I, I like the Monster of the Week ones. Right, right. Yeah. I remember the, some of the Stephen King, like, baseball ones were fun and stuff, mm -hmm. where he'd step in and that. But yeah, I mean, it's been so long, I'm not sure I, I remember mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I like the idea of starting there. I like the idea of thinking about the, the genre part of, of my work. Um, when I first started writing stories, like you know, like seriously, at like 20 or so, um, I was really into, and still I'm really into, like uh, Dennis Johnson and Raymond Carver and Amy Hempel and people like that. And I kind of thought like I had to stop being into like fantasy and sci-fi and like do that stuff, um, which meant I wrote. Uh, we were talking earlier with some Grassons, I called them like cover songs. I wrote like a lot of like Dennis Johnson cover stories, mm -hmm. right? Um, which were fine, you know, in, in those early imitations. And then at some point, after like a half a decade of writing pretty straightforward, sort of realist work, I started letting some of that stuff back in, and the work just kind of came alive, right? It was more honest about who I was and where I came from and like, mm -hmm. the things that mattered to me. Um, so I, I don't know, I like having that in the mix. I like having that stuff. But I also think it was maybe good for me to, to let it go for a little while, too, and force myself to, to learn some of those other mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I guess crossing a genre means when you write, say, a sci-fi story, but it ends up being somehow better. I mean, I still, I still kind of try to figure that out. I mean, I, I tell my students is what I tell my students is that um, as long as you've, you've f focused on uh, character and relationship, that to me is what allows you to cross genre. In some, yeah. The the other the other way you can do it, I think, is um, at the level of of language mm -hmm. somehow. Absolutely. And the other thing that I'm I'm interested about what you do is at the level of the line yeah. and the and the and the sentence. Mm -hmm. And um, I, we talked a little bit about this the other night, and and uh, I asked you if you used to be a if you were a poet. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And the answer is no, not, not yeah. really, yeah. I, I started out, I mean, I was writing poetry when I was like 18 or 19, it was really bad. I mean, really I was writing Doors lyrics, um, which are not <laughs> exactly poems. Because <laughs> I hadn't read any poetry, but I was trying to re write poetry, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, well, I think two things. One is, I, the definition I like, really, of literary fiction now is uh, Robert Boswell's from A Half Known World. He calls, uh, it says, Literary fiction is any fiction that aspires to be art. And I think I like that. That, that gets rid of the genre argument, right? You can write mm -hmm. a sci-fi story that's aspiring to be art, you mm -hmm. know? Um, of course you can, and of course there's lots to do. Um, so I, I like that a lot. Um, I think for me, we talked a little at dinner, but I think for me, I, I almost always start from language. Um, I'm not a very good idea person. If I had to come up with like an idea for a story, it's, it's usually stolen or kind of bad, or like it doesn't have very good legs. Um, I like starting from from the position of language and a voice or a speaker or a, or a, a kind of diction or syntax and like and let that generate out, you know? Mm -hmm. um, rather than having a pre-existing thing that I'm trying to like capture, it's more like sentence by sentence trying to build out the world that I'm mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's for me, more successful mm -hmm. and works better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I usually start from uh, either image mm -hmm. or, or the, the closest concession I make to um, plot is somebody in situation. Yeah. Absolutely. And then just see where um, 
where uh, that goes. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess something else along those lines about you starting from fr from a line or from language and, and building outward is how do you know when to when to stop building outward? I mean, again, right. it's it's a it's a, it's it's a common dilemma in teaching writing, but it's also something that maybe we as writers have kind of osmosed, mm -hmm. kind of understanding mm -hmm. when we've we've arrived, but have you ever been conscious of, of, of going outward and going, okay, uh, when the hell am I going to stop? How do I know this is going to, this is going to arrive? Right. It's supposed to go. Um, I mean, I think things sort of move plotward as I go, right? Mm -hmm. You sort of, you start getting an idea of who the character is, you start getting an idea of sort of the world you're dealing with, you sort of start seeing those possibilities for story. Um, I, but I'm, I'm an overwriter, I overwrite hugely over. Both of my novels were at some point twice as big as they are now. Um, the I always keep a cut file where I throw all the stuff I threw away in. It makes me feel brave to throw stuff away. I, I have it. Um, but you keep it. I keep it. Right, so like, that's a little less brave. Right, right, right. No, absolutely, yeah. But it makes me feel like I can just I can do it without it. There's no consequences. I can get it back. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think for the the new novel, the cut file was like like twenty thousand words longer than the actual mm -hmm. book, right? Like I mean, I wrote this enormous amount of stuff to get the good thing, which uh, will inevitably be too long in reviews, right? Um, but, uh, so I don't know a lot. I mean, I, I'm sort of building things out. Um, I read this book about uh, improv comedy a couple of years ago, which I, which I like but don't know very much about. And I was just talking about like the basic rules of improv. And one of them being this idea when you're working with a partner and you're like building a scene together, um, that the first person like puts something forward and the other person has this choice, right? Which is to accept or reject that thing. And that in good improv, you always say yes and, right? So. Um, and there's an example in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books where he um, was talking about two people doing improv and the first person says something like, um, I have a wooden leg and it's covered with termites. And if, the, if your partner says, no you don't, <laughs> then the scene, the scene is over, right? You're sort of like, all right, cool, well, we'll try. Um, but the partner says like, yes, and they're getting over my chair, then now, now we're moving, right? So there's yes and. And so I think, I, I think about that a lot when I'm drafting. In the initial drafting, I'm building out it's, it's this yes and. Any idea that comes, like just jam it in, jam it in, jam it in. Um, you're, you, cut, you know, you're, you're associating when you're writing and like a, something will pop into your head and there's an instinct to be like, that's not part of the story I'm trying to tell. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing that, it's like, yes it is. Mm -hmm. And the sort of weirdness or the ill fit of that will make something interesting happen. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. I really like that. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, there comes this time when the thing is like huge and bloated and has a bunch of stuff that never really got assimilated and is just sitting there. And then that stuff has to start getting called out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I like that part. Like you sort of clear all the debris away, and hopefully what's left is is pretty yeah. good. You know, um, there was just a thing a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Laura Vandenberg just had a, a debut novel come out a couple of weeks ago, and she published. I'm trying to remember what magazine it was, but a list of all the stuff she like took out of her novel, and. Um, and it's great, and a lot of it is sort of like incomprehensible. It's like, how was that part of that novel, mm -hmm. right? But of course, my novels are full of that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, like this path and this thing, and you know, all this stuff that um, the debris of it isn't like, mm -hmm. like, why did I think that was going to work? And mm -hmm. I and I didn't really. I was just trying stuff out. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. I think that's really exciting. The sort of the surprise of that, and that every thought you have in the year you're drafting, or, you know, a first draft maybe should go in. Yeah. And then you can yeah be militant about it later instead of, instead of saying no before you even. Yeah, understand <laughs> kicking the editor yeah, out of your head. Absolutely, when yeah. You're working on it. See, I have always wanted to be an overwriter. Uh -huh. but I'm a I'm an underwriter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a good profession. No, and, right. it's, yeah, it's stable, good novel. money, it's responsible. <laughs> um, but I I'll like write like three pages, and then I'll write three and a half, and then I'll write three and a quarter, and then I'll have a spurt and write. Uh, two more pages, right. and it just takes me months to build. Sure, a, this is stories. Yeah. Novels are <laughs> completely different. Right. Um, uh, uh, build it up, and so I kind of always, for me, the exciting part is kind of feeling like I'm kind of running on fumes mm -hmm. every day when I mm -hmm. get up, and seeing if I can extract enough right. fuel. So I've never had all of that yeah. that stuff. That you can just throw out. Right, right. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I have to throw stuff in. Yeah. <laughs> God. I mean, it's it's funny because I think uh, I started writing that way partly to like to write novels, like trying to how do you make enough material for a novel? And that was one way. Is like just everything goes in, and then you have all this material. 
And I think, unfortunately, I think I've broken my short story muscle a little bit. Like, oh. between the two novels, mm -hmm. like, all right, I'm going to write some short stories. Mm -hmm. And I'd start, like, drafting up a story, and they'd have 10,000 words and hadn't, like, found the beginning of the story yet, you know? And it'd be like, oh. So it's, I, can write, <laughs> I can write really short stories, like 500, 1,000 words. But, like, that, like, 3,500 word, like, sweet spot literary journal yeah. short story. I feel like I've sort of forgotten how to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I'm going to have to get that back someday. I don't like hearing that. No. I, uh, I, uh, did you want to write a novel? Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't want to write right, a novel. Right. You're just being forced to? Yes. By the other underwriters? Yes. Yeah. And, and now I want to. Right. I mean, right. now uh, I'm in it, but I've hated it for so long. Yeah. Everything that I love starts out with hate. Right, good, yeah. So when yeah. I first moved to this town for the first three years, I hated it. Right. And wanted to get the hell out. Now I love it. Right. I love it here, I do. Um, and it's the same thing with, 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 with the novel. Yeah. And, and I, my dilemma is, I love working on it, tinkering with it, mm -hmm. uh, getting it in shape, but I worry about the, the short story muscle because yeah. I love the short story form so much and all I think about writing after this novel, the only things that come to mind are uh, other novels. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I just interviewed uh, Jonathan uh, Lethem for Salon and he was talking about his new collection, and which is his third collection in a row that collects like 10 years worth of stories, you know, mm -hmm. so he's written three collections in three decades kind of thing. Um, and uh, he's talking like for him, he's mostly writing novels where he writes a short story a year to like stay in practice. And so these are always these sort of collections of that, which seems like a smart mm, yeah. idea I maybe should have done. Um, <laughs> I, uh, but I think really right now my interest is sort of in the, in the novel. I, I really, I've really enjoyed novel writing. I like being in the big project and I like sort of having that world to go to every day. Um, but I also think even with that, like some of what keeps you in is is finding a way for there to be lots of voices and lots of forms in a novel and to have a lot of things in it. And so even though it's this one long project, that that it's not one thing, right? And like yeah. that, so that there is yeah. a way in which I, I still want to try out those kind of things. Well, working on a, a particular section or episode for me is kind of a yeah. short story-ish. It definitely has some, And the yeah. thing I like about the novel, it's not like a long short story. Because right. short stories are rigorously uh -huh. structured yeah. and, and precise, and novels can you can dive off over here and see what happens, or dive off over there and see what happens. And so that really mitigates a lot of I the, think so too. The, yeah. the dilemma of, of working on one thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like I'm working on one right, thing. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's good. Um, I have a, I have a Flannery O'Connor, I think is always a, a good craft yeah. icebreaker. Sure, all right. Um, and this is one of the things that she says about, um, where is that? Uh, meaning is what keeps the short story from being short. I prefer to talk about the meaning in a story rather than the theme of a story. People talk about the theme of a story as if the theme were like the string that a sack of chicken feet is tied with. <laughs> they think that if you can pick out the theme the way you pick the right thread in the chicken feed sack, you can rip the story open and feed the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, well, discuss. Discuss, right, improve on that. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, the up. reason I bring that up is, number one, I, I, I love Flannery O'Connor yeah. and how she writes about uh, writing, but it's it's a dilemma that she f always had when she was always asked to explain yeah. her work. Have what you seen I that letter she wrote back to the the students that I wrote almost, her? I almost brought it's it. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these these students like wrote her a letter and was like, our our whole class have been discussing the meaning of X story and what what these things are symbols for, and she just kind of wrote back this like everything you're doing is what's wrong with like education. And, like, yeah, your teacher, your teacher yeah. is ruining you. I am that? in a state of shock. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so good because they were figuring it out. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, um, I think one of the things that that always happens, I mean, it happens at every level of teaching, and, I, and but is this way in which we have to help writing students like learn how to read, like writers, not like like literary scholars, which is mostly what they've been trained to do, um, and because you know it's like how do you make things rather than maybe how you interpret them, and. Um, I think some of it is like stopping students from like hunting for like symbols and stuff like that because then they start thinking like that's what you're supposed to do in your writing like the story is like a code that you're laying down. Um, there's this great Brett Ant Anthony Johnson um, uh, essay that was I think it was in the Atlantic 
Um, I think it's called like write what you know or something, but it's sort of about like not doing that. Um, but he says, says uh, stories aren't about things, stories are things. Stories mm -hmm. aren't about actions, stories are actions. And that difference, right? Like not what a story is about, but what a story is. Mm -hmm. You know, like what the actual, the action that the story does to the reader is more interesting than what the story like means or what the theme is or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and your job as a writer is to like make a thing that acts rather than something that's about action or about meaning. Um, that seems really crucial to me to make that turn as a student when you're learning to read as yeah, a writer does. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of what, I, I'm, I won't be able to find it now, but uh, O'Connor says something like that about um, uh, when you're, when you're, you forget, readers forget that when, the, the writers aren't, re <sighs> Creating reality in fiction right. is artifice. Right, 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 absolutely. And, and, and the trick or the craft is to make that artifice work. Right. So it's not reality, it's yeah. not a photograph. Um, you are uh, 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 putting it together. Mm -hmm. um, I have a cheat sheet here. Sure, yeah. What is this? Um, I have here violence. <laughs> and Brian Evanson. Yeah. I thought of Brian Evanson. Do you know him? Yeah, absolutely. Brian's work is a big influence on mine. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 He said something interesting years ago about violence when he got, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he got fired from teaching at Brigham Young or he left because he was yeah. about to get fired um, because of the violence in his work. Well, I, I think if I remember right, it's not so, I mean, the violence is the obvious aspect of it. And, and we can loop back to violence in, in mind, because I'm happy to talk about that. But mm -hmm. um, I think I learned a lot about how to do violence from him. But I think what was objectionable in that context of Brigham Young was that um, he's removed the authorial moral judgment from his stories. Oh. And so his stories had these violent, sort of terrible um, actions in them, but the stories did not, like, there was never that liberal wink where you're like, you, you and I both know this is bad. Mm -hmm. And so he'd written, that was what was immoral about it, was that okay. if the story had just said, like, obviously this is a bad thing, and I'm writing a story about how it's a bad thing, then, that, then I think it would have been less objectionable. I could be wrong, but I think that's, no, that's that my does, take. No, that, uh, that does make sense. The thing I, I, I think I learned most from him about violence, it's funny, I was just talking about with some grad students like an hour ago, mm -hmm. uh, about in Brian Evanson. Um, so I write a lot about violence, and I think it's really important to me um, that the violence not, like, be enjoyable in a certain way. Like, that the violence, um, uh, you're both writing about it, but also critiquing it. You're both writing about it, but also sort of morally unpacking it, or morally trying to make the reader morally complicit in different ways. But that it shouldn't be like the violence in like an action movie, which is sort of like you're supposed to think is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Like those like expendable movies that keep coming out, where like three thousand mm -hmm. people die in them, and you're just supposed to be like, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like the <laughs> you're the, plotting. Like the death toll of one of those expendable movies is like like a like a 9-11. I mean, it's horrible. There's the first one, like 2,200 people die in it or something like that, which is unreal in a two-hour movie. Um, and you're cheering. It's like every action hero from the last 20 years is killing 2,000 people together. Um, that creeps me out. That's horrible, you know? Um, so the violence in mind I can't work that way. So, and so then the artistic trick is like, how do you have it? How do you write about it? And you're making it engaging and you're keeping the reader in and you're using presumably interesting, lively language how do you make this ugly thing uh, engaging on the page without like glorifying it or making you know what I mean? I think that's yeah. really that's really tricky. And Brian's work is maybe one of the places that, that helped me learn to do that because mm -hmm. I think he does it with a certain kind of moral flatness that, and and, um, yeah. and with very stark, I, un, unsentimental, unsensationalized depictions. I think the moral flatness would be flatness would be really crucial because it's kind of a paradox, right? And in the the one, the writer that comes immediately to mind is is uh, Cormac McCarthy, sure, yeah. where I mean the paradox is that you're writing about something that is ugly and awful and detestable, but you're using beautiful language, right? right. And how do you get out of that 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 trap mm -hmm. of, of making it beautiful? And I think it has something to do with what you just said about about this this moral yeah. flatness, this 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 remove, mm -hmm. taking the judgment out of it. Yeah, you, I mean, then you put it in the reader's hands, right? And yeah. the sort of reader's morality, um, because there's one of Evanston's books, there's a novel piece called Last Days, which is about a, um, a one-handed detective who's trying to solve a murder inside a, a mutilation cult, 
where every like these two one-handed guys show up to hire him to to do this. Um, I'm only smiling because I've I've seen Brian read from. He thinks it's really funny, which is weird. It doesn't sound funny when I just said it. Uh, <laughs> the first time I saw him read from, I was like, oh, he thinks this is like absurd, absurdly <laughs> hilarious. Um, but and so the the uh, but there's this point late in the book where the detective becomes sort of this like angel of death, and he's taking out all these really terrible people. Um, and and I think you're you're but you you know there's this trick where you cheer for the protagonist in a book. You you're on the protagonist's side. You're with them. You're in their perspective. You want the protagonist to get their goals. And so in this moment, his goal is to like take out all these guys. And he's like killing people in their sleep with a cleaver. I mean, it's really violent. But like, and then at some point, the character stops and thinks like, Am I doing the right thing? How even if I am, how much more of this can I do and remain human? And you sort of realize like you were supposed to be questioning this stuff. And if you've just been sort of riding along passively, or even like, like who is getting these bad guys? Like he's still killing people in their sleep, right? And it's, it's this weird thing where he like turns the moral sort of lens back on you. And, um, and I found it shocking the first time I read it. I realized like I had been in the wrong moral position. Because he's interrupting the cool stuff. Yeah, 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 you're right. And it, it was really, it was really neat how that worked and how that made me, um, yeah, it was, it was like a shock to my system when it had, had sort of done, like I had, um, yeah, I'd been in the wrong spot. I should have been objecting 50 pages before I, my, and he had to you show. Should have the book across. Right, right. He had to point out that I should be objecting, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I thought that was really, That's really a smart. really neat move. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, this essay I really liked that was in the Antioch Review a couple of years ago by this guy, Paul Velda, and it's, I believe it's called The Fear of the Sublime. Um, and it's really interesting, and he's talking about the sublime, the transcendent in sort of art. And he's sort of going in this little sort of history of it through through thought, um, and he starts off with this sort of idea, which I think I'm gonna I'm gonna get all these details wrong, so just read it for yourself. But one of the people he's talking about is making this argument that you can't get to the sublime through the gutter, that you know that you can't um, that it's it's through beauty that we get to the sublime that you're sending. You can't get there through ugliness, and that um, and that to beautify a thing that's ugly or morally ugly is is maybe immoral. Um, it's a really interesting argument, and, and it sort of fits in with this, like mm -hmm. to to beautify a thing that we should not want in the world is maybe to do something wrong. And I don't, I don't know. It's complicated, but I think about that a lot in my work, and like I write about so much stuff that almost everything I write about is something I would not want. I, I wish didn't exist. Right? I spend a lot of time adding more of this to the world, and more of that to the world in a way, but I, I don't want it to exist in the real world. Um, and I also am somebody who knows that um, I'm talking about this, but I like. I do like violent movies, and I do am attracted to violence in literature, and vi I play violent video games, and you know, like, it's that way in which you're both, you're in and out, like, I don't want it to exist in the world, but I play with it in art, yeah. like, what's that, I yeah. Like, yeah, it's complicated. I, I like horror movies. Right, right, and yeah. That's a real recent thing for me, because I used to think <laughs> that they're, you know, they're, well, that they're, they're violent, right, and, mm -hmm. and, and gratuitously so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and they are, of course, because movies are, 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 it's, it's a piece of merchandise. Yeah. It's not necessarily work of art. But then when you see a movie like that, that is kind of, uh -huh. you're, you're watching it, a horror movie, and you're going, huh, this kind of like a work of art. Right. Kind of, you know, it really yeah. is kind of transcendent uh -huh. in, in some way. There's a great Martin Amos essay that's in his collected essays where he's talk, he's writing it when um, like Taxi Driver and, and those movies are first like coming out and he's talking about um, uh, how attracted he is to sort of the violence in these movies and, and while being like a pacifist really in real mm -hmm. life, right? Um, and, uh, and, he, and he's talking about how all of this stuff, like it exists because we want it. Like no one would make these like slasher flicks if we didn't right. go see them. We want it, right? So we can, we can outcry about the violence and these things, but, but we want it too. Mm -hmm. And so, and that there's a tension there that is worth exploring and is mm -hmm. worth exploring in art and worth thinking about and is, um, and the way that that sometimes sets up bad consequences in the world, where like we get okay with violence in a certain way, yeah. you know that that crossover happens the other way. Yeah. It's easy to say I don't want it in the real world, and I'm okay with it in art, but it's hard not to let that muddy. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. It's tricky. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm gonna go back to my cheat sheet. Sure. Yeah. Um, this, I I I kind of don't remember why I wrote some of these things sure, here, yeah. but so the word just, association was just like you know. yeah. Well, here I I have it and I circled it. I have a hard time reading, and I'm trying to remember what that means. 
Um, <laughs> it sounds like a personal problem, but I can help you out if you'd like. I mean, this might be the wrong list, I think. <laughs> um, I, I think what I was getting at there was um, this. I got asked this question once on a website about what are you reading, right? Or what did you read last year? And I, I can't. I get so mad, I get embarrassed asking that question because I think back and I go, oh, "Geez, I haven't read anything. Right, what am right. I doing?" Yeah. I mean, I teach re writing. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm a reader, and I for over 20 years, and I can't. And I talk to people I know, like you guys, and it's like, "Oh, Dan, did, did, did you read last week's uh, New Yorker the story of last right, week's right. New Yorker?" And I go, "New Yorker comes once a week. <laughs> right, right. How do you have time to read that?" <laughs> and and uh, I have like last year's books that came out sure. in my to read pile now still. Yeah. And so I've made an effort now to read a, a book a week. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I have to like mark down how many sure. pages yeah, I read, yeah. and it feels it feels great. It's mm -hmm. kind of like done something mm -hmm. to me. And I'm wondering, I guess if. Well, I guess if, if you have a hard time reading. <laughs> I mean, I think there's there's times, I read a lot. I mean, I, I um, there's this, uh, this Elaine Scarry book uh, that I've been reading off and on. I think it's called, like, On Beauty, um, but it's obviously about beauty. Um, it's really good, and she starts off right away with this, this sort of idea of, um, like, uh, like, beauty always creates imitation, or, be, you know, like, we, so we experience something beautiful, and we want to make something beautiful. And and I think that's my my early writerly impulses are that I, mm -hmm. I'm not a writer who's like I have something to say and I have to find a way to say it. Right. I think um, which maybe goes back to our Flannery O'Connor stuff. Um, my the first stuff I wrote was because there were things I liked so much that I wanted there to be more of them. Right. And so I would just I was like making my mm -hmm. own. Um, and so I and it's, that still exists. Like I can't really write without like a constant influx of like pretty good work. If I read like three or four like not great books in a row, like I have trouble at the desk, right? I mean, like it has to, good work has to be coming in. So I, I do read a lot and sort of and stay on it. Um, I uh, I actually try to read like a hundred books a year and usually do like eighty to hundred a year. Um, and uh, it's, but it's partly because I need it. I need. I mean, I need it to be alive and I need it to write and I can't do it without it. And you know, if I have to, I'll engineer all my classes so the students are reading the 15 books I want to be reading or something, you know. But um, yeah, right. Um, make the job work for you, you know. <laughs> the job work you. Come on. Um, but no. Um, but so th I think that's that's part of it for me. Uh, but I mean, it's crazy. Like I'm, I, you know, I'm wandering around my neighborhood, like reading books and stuff, trying to get my exercise and read at the same time. I'm just like an insane person about it. But um, but yeah, so a lot. Um, the only times I really can't read usually are when. Uh, like if I get on a run of bad books, sometimes it'll like uh, you know what I mean. It's almost like I was, I'll stop believing they're good books or something. It's a weird thing. Oh really? You read four bad books in a row, and you're like, maybe I'll just watch TV all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have to reset. The, the really the only time in my adult life that I didn't read a lot was the first year I applied to MFA programs. I um, I was 27, and I was. I had published a little bit, and I had been working in a magazine, and I, I just felt pretty confident. I felt pretty good, and um, and I didn't get in anywhere. I just was like a total shut out. I was waitlisted at one place, and I didn't get anywhere, and it really kind of shook my confidence, and I neither read nor wrote really anything for like eight months. I mean, it was sort of awful, um, but it's the only time in my life, and then I, I got back on, and I was like, okay. getting even. Yeah, it was, was a weird you. thing. I think I just, I, I thought I was in a place I wasn't, yeah. And yeah. it was like, yeah. yeah. So I bought an Xbox and, and worked on that for a while. And, you know, um, it was fine. And that, that, it's almost as good as reading and writing. So like, it was pretty good. Um, learned to balance those loves. It's yes. all right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah it was, I mean, there's really the only time where I just, um, it just really messed me up in a bad way. Um, yeah, it turned out okay, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, it did turn out yeah. okay. Um,